the predictions of international analysts about third world war are beginning to take shape. Nations will again face war in a global scale, plunging humanity again into the chaos and disaster. Anyone who is engaged in monitoring what is happening every day will realize that we are faced with a critical and delicate situation. An economic crisis which since 2008 has been sinking economies and impoverishing developed countries. The appearance of conflicts facing the world's major powers are the main topics that cause not only political experts but also many ordinary people to worry about the very real possibility that we will find ourselves in the outbreak of a new global conflict. The war in Syria started in 2011 between the Syrian government and the rebels involving crucially Russia and the United States with Putin supporting Bashar al-Assad and Obama supporting the rebel side. Russia is not willing to allow the US and its allies to invade Syria, since in addition to Syria being an important ally of Russia, Russia has a naval base in the Syrian city of Tartus, making Syria strategically important for Russia in the Middle East. Not only does Syria have the support of Russia, China and Iran are other allies of Assad who are not willing to see the West invade Syria. Russia has for a long time provided military equipment to the Syrian army and sent warships to the area, recently also adding air support to the forces of Assad, as well as the sending of troops by Iran. On the other side are the alliance of America and their allies bombarding Syrian territory and supporting the rebel enemies of Assad. Therefore, a clash between these powers and the attacks that are happening or a clear ground invasion by the White House and NATO in Syria would almost certainly lead to the worsening of the conflict, pushing other major nations to enter and cause the outbreak of a war on a large scale. Something similar is happening with the conflict in Ukraine. A conflict started in 2014 by the annexation of Ukrainian territories by Russia, with the ensuing confrontation between the forces of the Ukrainian government and the pro-Russian rebels. Since then, a race has happened in which Russia has been, according to reliable sources, sending troops, tanks and weapons to the pro-Russian separatists, while the European Union, together with NATO and the United States, have been doing the same thing with the government of Ukraine, a conflict that faces principally the US and Russia, as well as the European Union and NATO. Despite no direct conflict having yet occurred, from the year 2013, Tensions have heightened between the two Koreas, even reaching the breaking of the Armistice of 1953, which had set in stone the non-aggression between the two countries. The North Korean regime of Kim Jong-un is carrying out several nuclear test detonations, not only as a show of force, but as a response to the economic sanctions that the UN has applied to this country, and the maneuvers of American and South Korean combat forces underway in waters close to North Korea. The resumption of a conflict between North Korea and South Korea, with the participation of the US supporting the latter, would also likely see the involvement of Russia, and especially China, supporting the North Korean regime. Iran's nuclear program, which the government of Iran says has the objective of improvements to healthcare, has made powers as, such as Israel and the United States suspicious, arguing that the true purpose of the program is to create nuclear bombs to attack their respective countries, leading these countries together with Europe to enforce economic sanctions against Iran to deter them from building their suspected weapons of mass destruction. This situation has led to escalating tensions, especially between Iran and Israel, with the latter declaring itself willing to attack Iran to stop its nuclear program. Arguably, the worst outcome would be that the US and Israel invade Iran. Russia and China would likely also support Iran without hesitation. 
We should also note the complex diplomatic situation between the US and Venezuela. The economic crisis, which has for several years consumed Venezuela, has resulted in bloody protests against the government of Nicolas Maduro, with the United States punishing it with harsh economic sanctions. If the US attempted to invade Venezuela under the pretext of protecting the civilian population, a serious conflict could begin that would involve other allies of Venezuela, including several Latin American countries, as well as possibly also Russia and China. If we consider all these rising diplomatic tensions and potential conflicts confronting the world's major powers, along with the global economic crisis we are suffering, it is not difficult to imagine the outbreak of a world war on an unprecedented scale. But should we really be worried? Or will the outbreak of this global conflict just be a distant possibility, even with all these conflicts and tensions? There have been countless localized conflicts since the end of World War II, so why should we listen to pessimism and alarmist warnings? Arguably, the best way to understand whether the most powerful nations are considering the possibility of war is to look at what decisions they are making. For example, the Chinese government is without transparency, increasing its military strength and expanding its territory in the sea and air multiplying its military budget by four in ten years and heightening tensions with rivals such as Japan, South Korea and the US. China has also increased its rice imports from 575,000 tons of rice in 2011 to 2.6 million tons in 2012. What is alarming about all of this is that all of this imported rice is being stored the Chinese government has in recent years been building huge cities with the capacity for 64 million people, already completed but still uninhabited, built in areas far from existing settlements, for example in the Mongolian desert. Notably, Russia built 5,000 underground shelters in Moscow in 2012. Russian government officials have stated that these bunkers are for the general population and this project is carried out by way of caution and not as a way of creating panic about future events. On the other hand, Europe has quickly designed, built and equipped the so-called Doomsday Seed Vault in Svalbard, Norway, which contains tens of thousands of seed varieties. It can reasonably be assumed that these seeds are being preserved in case of a major event such as a nuclear war or a natural disaster. Russia, for its part, is also creating a warehouse with the DNA of virtually all living beings on Earth and some already extinct through the Moscow State University. The project seeks to collect DNA from all beings existing to freeze and preserve them and has financial support from the Russian government of $194 million. On the other hand, the government of the United States has been accumulating tens of millions of emergency meals and other supplies regionalizing their emergency nationwide distribution centers. The government has also bought nearly 2 million units of ammunition in recent years, and the Pentagon has been actively developing and practicing live simulations for situations from economic collapse to large-scale and consistent civil unrest. Since 2012, Russia has begun modernizing its missile system, producing S-400 Triumph missiles, which are surface-to-air missiles, with bases located in coastal and border areas of the country. Vladimir Putin approved on December 26, 2014, a new military doctrine that sees the US and NATO as their biggest threats. Putin also announced on June 16, 2015, that Russia is increasing its nuclear arsenal, adding more than 40 intercontinental ballistic missiles to its equipment, following a complaint by the Russian authorities about an apparent US plan to deploy tanks and weapons on the borders shared by NATO states with Russia. Adding to the crisis, there have also been numerous sightings of Russian military units, aircraft, ships and submarines in Europe. Considering all these contributions to the tension, here are some examples of how the powers are preparing for an imminent conflict to protect their core interests. The US Facing the economic crisis that endangers its hegemony as the first economic power and the advance of China to take its place 
has prompted the Obama administration to undertake one of the old strategies of the USA. The invasion of countries in the Middle East to take over its natural resources, oil and gas. And for this reason, the US has her eye on countries such as Syria, Iran and Venezuela, countries rich in oil and gas. Venezuela has the world's largest reserve of oil and Iran the fourth largest. The United States is well aware that it needs these oil reserves to retain its position as first world power against the rise of China and Russia. Countries, incidentally, which have important trade agreements with Syria, Iran and Venezuela. For their part, China and Russia want to dethrone the US through their economic strategies, making agreements with countries in their own currencies, circumventing the US dollar and threatening American hegemony. Both Russia and China will defend their interests in Syria, Iran, Venezuela and other countries where the US hopes to spread its tentacles. In this way, the sides in this new global conflict would be as follows. On one side, led by the USA, would be Israel, NATO, Japan, France, United Kingdom and South Korea. And on the other side, led by Russia, would be China, North Korea, Iran, Syria, Venezuela, Cuba, at least to begin with. Obama has already made moves not only causing the Arab revolts which turned the Middle East countries upside down, but also by applying economic sanctions to Russia, North Korea, Venezuela, and inciting conflicts between the two Koreas in Ukraine, in Venezuela, in Syria, trying to emerge victorious in these proxy wars with the intention of causing rivals to collapse and gain control of the natural resources of those countries. We must not forget that the USA is prepared to take any action as a pretext to start the conflicts necessary for these goals. These dirty actions, perpetuated not only by the US but also by other powers, have been happening for a long time, with the elite creating a false pretext to convince the public of the need to carry out a further measure or decision which achieves their real goals. If we review the newspaper archives of our history, we can find many examples of self-directed or false flag attacks. For example, the burning of the Reichstag in Germany in the year 1933 by the Nazis, who blamed a communist Dutchman, and so had the pretext to end its communist opponents. Year 1898, the War of Independence in Cuba. The USA takes the decision to sink its own boat, the main, and blame it on the Spaniards, and so had the excuse to go to war. This was admitted in 1980 by the US government. Mainila incident, Russia, in the year 1939. At that time, the Soviet Union needed an excuse, a pretext to start their desired invasion of Finland. In this case, the government of the USSR decided to perpetuate a false flag attack, firing their cannons against its own people in the region of Mainila, a region bordering Finland, later blaming the Finns and invading them. September the 11th, 2001, an attack which gave the Bush administration the prerogative to initiate the invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq under the pretext of eliminating terrorists. Like September the 11th, the attacks in Madrid in 2004 and London in 2005 are also attacks, or rather false flag attacks, with many uncertain facts but they were satisfactory to continue convincing citizens of the need to stay in the Middle East, of the need to fight those terrorists, providing the pretext to gain access to the natural resources of those countries. Thus began the fight against terrorism. Against terrorists who, interestingly, were sponsored and financed by those same people now hunting them. So if you think if we walked away from this, didn't give them money today, it would be worse for us from a security standpoint? I do. I do. We're building a relationship that just did not exist. I said in our last trip when you were with me that we had a huge trust deficit, in part because the United States had, to be, to be fair, we had helped to create the problem we're now fighting. How? Because when the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan, we had this brilliant idea that we were going to come to Pakistan and create a force of Mujahideen, equip them with Stinger missiles and everything else to go after. The same story now governs ISIS, or Islamic State. The terrorist group formed from part of Al-Qaeda, 
whose funding comes mainly from the US and its Middle Eastern allies. The creation of the Islamic State has had the effect of increasing instability and the chaos already previously provoked by the West with the fueling of the Arab revolts in 2011 in Tunisia, Libya, Syria to topple the governments of those countries and gain access to their resources. There is evidence that the US has been financing these revolutions and even mercenaries in these countries forming the so-called rebel armies that have been supplied with weapons by both Europe and the US which then ended up in the hands of jihadists because in these rebel groups there are not only US funded mercenaries there are also jihadis from Al Qaeda or ISIS. This close relationship between mercenaries and jihadists is the result of a company responsible for training and providing mercenaries to governments wishing to hire for their activities. A company who curiously calls itself ISIS standing for Integrated Systems Improvement Services. It is a company that offers security, intelligence, technology and training to governments and private companies. This company is strategically positioned around the world with a team of highly accredited management staff. After the emergence of ISIS and the consequent disclosure of this information that connects the company with the terrorist group, the company decided to change its name, called at present SIS, Special Intelligence Service, as a way to distance themselves from that more than suspicious coincidence. Israeli Prime Minister Netanyahu has stated on several occasions that Iran has been financing terrorist groups, thus implicating Iran in a possible nuclear false flag attack in which Iran would have allegedly provided nuclear weapons to jihadists. Thus, the US and its allies would have the pretext to invade Iran. While loud leaders can become extremely ambitious and capable of wrongdoing in the pursuit of their own interests, surely no one could be interested in the outbreak of a Third World War, which would likely be nuclear and cause untold destruction and chaos? Truly, we do not know how many countries will be directly affected in this war, but if something can be glimpsed in this World War, as in the two before it, there is something more than mere interest. In this war there would be no winning countries, the only winners would be those who really pull the strings. Those who are above the political class and that use others as puppets to achieve their goals. The economic and financial elite. And although large employers are found in this elite, bankers for example, that would be seriously damaged by a global nuclear war, the real elite has objectives that are not economic but rather about power and control. This elite led mainly by multi-billion dollar families such as the Rockefellers, Rothschilds and Morgans, which over time have been harvesting power, both economic and political, through their financial institutions and companies, have been and are the drivers of the world wars and dirty operations to expand their tentacles where they see fit. Through the instigation of these world wars, the elite has not only been increasing economic benefits, but expanding its control over the system achieving concrete goals that would lead them slowly to their ultimate goals with every war. But what would be the goals of the elite in this new world war? Firstly, reduction of the population. Personalities such as David Rockefeller and Bill Gates have expressed concern about the number of human beings that inhabit the planet and the need therefore to reduce the world's population. They say that we are already almost 8,000 million and growing in a world of finite natural resources. Not only would reducing the global population reduce the pressure on finite resources, it would also allow them to exercise greater control more easily upon humanity. A nuclear war is perfect for killing thousands of millions of people which are a hindrance to the elite. Those countries that are not affected directly by the conflict, for example from the fall of nuclear weapons, will be severely affected by the null presence or shortage of food which will result in madness among citizens, killing for the last remaining resources, or simply starving to death. Secondly, end states and completely sink the global economy. One of the important goals with this world war is the destruction of states, which is necessary to sink economies, increasing employment to 100%, causing money to lose its value, and ferment panic and chaos in the citizenship who would have to compete forcibly for the last food in the supermarkets to survive, creating serious unrest among every population. 
This will lead to a political power vacuum, and thus people will be left without political guidelines, without anyone to maintain order in each country, creating an international situation of lack of control, which will cause humanity to be more receptive to the introduction of a new world order. At this point, it is important to consider the mass migrations that are occurring in Europe by people affected by conflicts, particularly in Syria, which could lead to the collapse of the European states and ultimately chaos and division. Thirdly, destruction of morals. This third world war could also cause the collapse of morals, values, even hope of the human being, bringing him to despair and nihilism. In this way, the population will be more easily tempted by any form of order that can offer a return to hope and values. All these factors are necessary to allow, as Rockefeller said, a perfect crisis, a great social cataclysm that causes the world's population to accept as the only solution the ultimate goals sought by the elite over the years. The creation of a world government. A world government as the only alternative to all that evil, under the promise that with such union of all countries and civilizations under a single state, there will be no more wars or problems between human beings. While this may sound like something beautiful and for the benefit of all, Behind it lies the macabre intention to bring humanity under total control, powerless, except to serve this group of elites. But don't the elite control humanity already? Well, it certainly has achieved through capitalism a way of life to its benefit and a reach over almost all countries. However, they want absolute control over us and to reduce much of the world's population, making that control easier and consistently more viable, and putting an end to the incessant rise of the population that could result in so much instability. The Third World War is also necessary, as an economic crisis alone is unlikely to result in the necessary uprising on an international level. But in who are we going to place our confidence after all this chaos? After so much corruption, injustice, and evil by the financial and political elite? In the same puppet politicians, which together with the financial elite have led us to this hell? We know they're going to provoke a new world war to create this ambitious world government, but who will lead it? The last part of this video is a theory about what could happen after the third world war to carry out the creation of the world government. We present it as a hypothesis in which you can decide to believe right now or not, but we recommend you don't forget it. We live in a system, not only of criminals and murderers, but in a hidden system. A system that lies to us, but also hides information. It hides from us discoveries of cures for diseases that supposedly cannot be healed, such as the cure for cancer. It hides technological advances, or the genetic manipulation of human DNA and animals. What would you think? If I told you that all of the technology that we're used to seeing in films, or that some people claim to have seen believing they are extraterrestrial technology, is technology actually created here on Earth by governments? Certainly, you might think that I'm crazy, or it's impossible, and that we are a couple of lunatics who have seen too many sci-fi films. But to tell the truth, it is believed that the Nazis were the pioneers in creating so-called anti-gravity technology. The General of the SS, Hans Kammler, who was also scientific engineer in charge of the development of the V-2 missile, jet aircraft, flying wings, and civil engineering other projects, was in charge of a project to create a vehicle able to soar like the famous UFO prototypes. The Nazis were in charge of several tests of this technology of anti-gravity, which were confiscated by the Americans upon winning the war, through the well-known Operation Paperclip which transported Nazi scientists to the United States to extract from them all the knowledge and progress made. Among those Nazi scientists would be the known Werner von Braun, who is in charge of numerous projects in NASA. We must wonder what will come of all this information with the Third World War and why the elite hides it from us. According to certain sources, the final step that the elite will take after the Third World War 
for the establishment of the world government is going to be a false alien landing, i.e. the elite has prepared a false presentation of alleged beings from other planets with this kind of technology coming to aid us. This will be orchestrated by the elite and backed by the media establishments. These beings, which surely will be of humanoid appearance, but with otherworldly differences to ensure greater acceptance by us, will say that they had created us a long time ago, but waited to see if we could solve our own problems. Hence, the elite do not want our current problems, such as hunger, wars, diseases to be resolved. In short, everything bad in the system in which we live gives greater appeal and urgency to the implementation of a world government. Isn't this all very coincidental? What began as many armed conflicts, problems, diplomatic seizures, and right now with the worst economic crisis of all time? What a chance would be these fake beings appeared to just after the conflict, just at the most critical moment. Certainly, it is something causal. It is understandable if this appears paranoid and lacking credibility. But if we examine the system in which we live, and look at the constant bombardment of media and film about the hypothesis of life on other planets through series, films, music, with even politicians and personalities of the church talking about it in a serious way, we realize that there is the intention to convince us of such an idea. If you think that no one would believe this extraterrestrial farce, I present you with a historical example. On October 30th, 1938, a radio show in New York issued a false story about an alien invasion transmitted by the broadcaster Orson Welles. This program came to be a dramatization of a book called The War of the Worlds, but broadcast as if it were real news. The result was that thousands and thousands of people fled New York from these alleged attacks. If back then it was a success, imagine what could happen today with all these operational technologies and humanoid beings created in laboratories. People who have claimed this farce of an alien landing include the scientist from NASA, Werner von Braun, who before dying warned that the elite had prepared a false landing of extraterrestrials as a final strategy to attract the masses toward a world government. And Bill Cooper, a former member of the US military killed by police in 2001, who claimed that UFOs are technology which was created on Earth a long time ago and kept hidden specifically for this theatrical farce. We do not know if this hypothesis of fake aliens is true, and so we present it as a hypothesis that you can decide whether to believe in or not, but we recommend you don't forget that this false extraterrestrial landing might occur, and that you avoid falling into its trap. Considering all this information about an impending World War III, what can we do? We should take a look at the newspaper archives of our history and see what our ancestors did when faced with similarly serious moments. A revolution. Given the situation of international crisis in which we find ourselves, and the short time that we have left, the action that we must carry out is an international revolution involving the taking of parliaments by the people in all possible countries especially those with nuclear weapons, and force our politicians to ensure that all nuclear warhead and long-range missiles are destroyed immediately. We will need to convince the armies and state security bodies to join us, as we will need their help to direct us to the weapons. But the first thing that must be done before any forceful action is disseminate this information so that it can reach the maximum number of people possible sharing this video through social networks and using those same networks to create a space for debate and decision making at an international level. It is time, sisters and brothers, that we rise up against this elite, that we leave aside our stupid differences, our fears, our selfishness, that we strive to save humanity and future generations, that we finish with this criminal and murderous system that has tormented us and that distract us from what really matters. We have to spread this message and to carry out an international revolution to stop this third world war. This video is an international call to the action.